David Moronis, and this is my wife, Julie. Hi, I am the director of Calvary Christian Academy, and this is our story. So we've been married for 26 years. Uh, we met at a singles gathering at church, and um, the first date we had, I stood her up. He did, but it was okay. I forgave him, and we, we did have a first date, and it was a nice one. So it worked out. <laughs> We started dating and he did not stand me up again. And we got married about eight months later, have been happily married and life has been good. We have two daughters and a grandson who is about six weeks old. And so we've been blessed, but life was a challenge for us as well. There were things that we went through. Okay, I was married once before. This is um, my second marriage. Um, my first wife was unfaithful. And, um, and I was, you know, devastated. I didn't know where to, what to do, so we ended that marriage. I married my high school sweetheart also, and um, we were married for about five years and that marriage ended in divorce. Um, he was unfaithful, but um, we had met in youth group when we were young and um, had, I thought, a relationship with Jesus. But you can only be responsible for your own choices. And it was incredibly painful. A friend of mine invited me to church and um, I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Something has to happen here. and. I went to church, I got saved that same night, and I joined the singles apartment, and God just started working on me. I was on my knees before the Lord, and um, my sister was very instrumental in bringing me to church, and um, I'm grateful for that time, but Jesus was there for me and restored my life, but it was a, a very dark, hard time. And um, met Dave, in the singles department and uh, God blessed us. And um, yeah, we, we've been happy. It's been a journey, <laughs> but it's been a good one. God redeems. In my first marriage, um, I uh, did not communicate. I did not listen. My second, I wanted it to be different. And in order for her to do that, I have to listen and um, and not give her the silent treatment. Um, communicate with your wife. You have to do it, no matter what. And it's the best thing to do. We were careful with our words, um, making sure that we didn't say things that couldn't be unsaid um, or that would hurt each other. And um, we prayed together and we were in a young marrieds class at church, which helped us a lot. Um, there were videos and trainings and things that we did because we wanted to do it better the second time. We had a little one and we wanted to raise her up the way we needed to. And so um, God blessed our marriage and he gave us a second chance. Over the next five weeks, we're, we will show a video of five couples from our church family. The videos are gonna tell us how that couple met, what conflict they overcame, and maybe some advice that they have for young marrieds or just simply married couples. Before we begin tonight, today, I'd like to ask you to join me in prayer whether you're on our Parker campus, whether you're at McCulloch or whether Sweetwater, maybe even watching online, I want to ask that you would join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts tonight. Across all of our campuses, we join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we ask that you would open up our ears and our hearts. And Lord, we ask that this weekend, through this series and over the next five weeks, 
you would strengthen families through our Created For series. As we examine the Bible and how it applies to our lives, may we leave this weekend changed and transformed by a holy God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I am so grateful to be back in the pulpit. I don't know what they call this out west. In the south, we call this a pulpit. And I'm so glad to be back here. I I love to speak. I love to preach. I enjoy it. If somebody tells me I did a great job or they really enjoyed it, I like to hear that. I I I mean, I do. And I feel a little bit guilty because I enjoy speaking and preaching and teaching God's word so much. I I love it. I I enjoy it. I have fun doing it. I I love to see God bringing life change to people. I I don't mind admitting it at all because this is the way God has wired me. This is the way that he has gifted me. He's gifted me spiritually to do exactly what you see me doing today, which is preaching and teaching God's word. He created my personality. He created my spiritual gifts and he made me and he shaped me. And he said, Joe, I'm calling you to this ministry and I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. I love doing what God has created me to do. It's refreshing. I, I, enjoy, I don't get drained when I preach and teach. In fact, I get encouraged. It refreshes my heart. It fills me with incredible joy. But as much as I enjoy it, God has not created me solely for this. In fact, this is not my only purpose. Understand preaching and teaching is a huge responsibility and I don't take it lightly, but there is something that God has created me for with even a higher responsibility and that I enjoy so much more. And that is my role as a husband and my role as daddy. That There is nothing I enjoy more than being a daddy to my four girls and being a husband to my wife. Uh, I enjoy it. It, how, it is how God has created me. It's how he has designed me. I get to use my passion and my humor at home and the girls don't laugh at all. You know, I'm at the dinner table and I say, hey, raise your hand if you, you know, and the girls ignore me. But one of the things I really enjoy doing is that I get to grow in my relationship with God. And as I grow in my relationship with God, I get to grow in my relationship with my wife and I get to grow in my relationship with my girls. And that's where the most important thing, what I was created to do, evolves and unfolds. But enough about me. You are created for a purpose too. You have a purpose. You were not an accident. God has created you intentionally and purposefully. If you are a dad or if you are a husband, if you're a son or a daughter, it is imperative that you understand regardless of what success you've had in the business world, regardless of what financial success or lack thereof, the most important role that God has created you for is for family. Whatever role you play in your family, if you're a husband, if you're a wife, if you're a son or you're a daughter or a grandparent, God has created you for that. There is nobody that has a child like you do. There is nobody that has a grandchild like you do. God has intentionally created and designed you for your family just as it is right now. And it is our prayer that over the next five weeks, you would embrace it, you would grow in it, you would enjoy it, and you would begin to allow God to light your world up with joy and passion for how he has designed you. Our foundational passage of scripture that we're going to use for this created four series is found on page two in your Bible. Now, I noticed earlier when I picked this up today that inside it says Calvary Baptist Church. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to write underneath that say, gifted me this Bible. Calvary Baptist Church gave this Bible to me. We want you to take these Bibles home and use them. They're located right underneath the seat back in front of you, underneath the seat of the person in front of you. If you're at our Parker campus, I want to encourage you to get up now, go back, grab one of these Bibles. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 on page 2. And so I encourage you to read along with me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said... It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought, and brought them to the man to see what he could call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And a man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now I understand what I'm about to share is not a very popular mainstream opinion today. Uh, with the entire world, it seems, pushing an agenda about male and female focused on the acceptance of multiple genders, that there's not only two genders, there's three or four, or actually now it's 150 genders. I understand that what I'm sharing today is actually a little countercultural, and I don't apologize for that at all. All I want to ask you to do, whether you agree with my opinion or not, is I want to ask that you would have an open mind and you would hear God's word and what God's design is when it comes to marriage. I understand what I share may sound bigoted, it may sound hateful, it may sound backwards, but I want to invite you to, to understand this with an open mind. I believe the Bible teaches that God created male and female on purpose. It wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an accident. You've heard it in the media, you've been taught it in elementary school and middle school and high school and college that humans evolved, that we were not created, we evolved, that we are kind of accidentally and randomly here, that some type of, uh, uh, maybe you remember the pictures in your biology book, some type of glob of amoeba evolved into an organism and then it gave rise to reptiles and to the animals and to the mammals and then to you and I. So uh, that's kind of the, 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 the basis of what is taught and has been taught for many, many years. Now, so I want to pose a question. If evolution is true, let's say if it is true, how did the male and female bodies independently originate? Independently and simultaneously, how did a male and female body come to be? How on earth could the female species independently evolve with a need for ovaries and the womb and the placenta and everything it takes to make a baby inside the woman? Because evolutionists argue and they teach us that, uh, um, uh, that a species evolves randomly and in response to their environment. That evolution occurs based on need or based randomly. But here we have a human being, in order for the human being to continue to exist, a male and a female must have originated or must have evolved simultaneously and independently of one another, without any intentional design behind them at all, with all the right sexual reproduction parts needed for another independent person. See, it's impossible for that to have randomly occurred. It's impossible for that to have randomly happened and simultaneously. How could nature evolve a female that is internally equipped to nourish a baby while at the same time evolving a male that internally produces sperm, you know, cells that create the sperm? And further, how is it that they independently and simultaneously conveniently evolved so that each mom and dad independently donate 23 chromosomes each to the human baby? 
that each of them have 23 chromosomes that they donate. And so you and I then end up, most people, 46 chromosomes. How does that happen accidentally? How does that happen randomly? See, the reality is what we read about in Genesis is actual factual history. The fact is the male and the female could not have evolved independently. The male and female were created by God purposely. If God had only created male, then obviously, and did not create female, then we, none of us would be here today. If God had only created the male and not the female or male or whatever, which one I said, if God had only created one of the genders or one of the sexes, then you and I would not be here today. But God created the male and God created the female intentionally on purpose. We were created for each other. And let me just mention this as we talk about husbands and wives, it begins with oneness. It begins with oneness all the way down to the cellular level. We were created for oneness. The way that God imagined and designed the male and female to be compatible in every way, sexually, physically, mentally, spiritually, it all comes down to oneness. God's plan for the husband and for the wife is to be one team for each other. They share their hearts together. They share their finances together. They share raising their children together. That's God's plan. That's how he designed it. That's how he wired it. And you and I can disagree with it. But how can you overcome the scientific facts? Now, in my house, for the sake of oneness... We share everything except Reese's cups, but we, we do, and her clothes. We don't share her clothes. It, it actually blew my mind when Christy began wearing my socks. You know, as we talk about oneness, oneness requires sharing of everything. Now, t-shirts, I understood. In fact, when she wore my t-shirts, that was a little sexy. I like that, you know, like my wife's wearing my NFL jersey, you know, it's, it's sexy, right? It's nice. But it was when she began wearing my socks that I lost it. I don't have a sock drawer that's all my own. In fact, I open up the sock drawer and I have to sort between the female socks and the male socks. And there is a difference all the guys know. You pick up the female socks and they feel like slippery, you know? They're like, hmm, these are attractive. Maybe I will wear these. But my wife, Christy, just wears my socks. And that's part of oneness. Sharing with each other is part of oneness. A husband and wife living together in the same space is oneness. Using the same bathroom is oneness. Sleeping in the same bed is oneness. Eating from the same dishes is oneness. Taking out the trash or filling up the trash can or dirty dishes in the sink. It's all about oneness. And as husbands and wives seek to create oneness, conflict is going to happen. Conflict is going to rise up. Why? Because we take two selfish people and tell them they're one and conflict is going to occur. So if you're experiencing conflict, good job. You're actually pressing in. You are, you're pressing into oneness. You're, you're trying to figure marriage out. So that's great and that's good. There will be toothpaste in the sink. You understand that? There will be clothes on the floor, accept it. There will be many, many, many shoes in the closet, men, accept it. There will be tight times financially. There will be times when somebody spends too much or spends too much time away or spends all their energy outside the home. As you seek oneness, conflict is guaranteed, but it's a doorway to experiencing oneness. So accept it, take a deep breath and say, okay. So let me, let me pause for just a moment. Let me encourage you to sign up for a life group. 
Husbands and wives, at the close of the service, I want to ask that you would go to the back. If you're at Parker, you can sign up for life groups there. If you're at McCulloch, you can sign up there. If you're at Sweetwater, at the close of the service, as you leave, sign up for a life group. Why? Because we have to work together in marriage. I need another husband speaking into my life. I need to be able to speak into another husband's life. Our wives need one another. Why? Because we're all growing in oneness. Now, conflict does not only happen internally between a husband and a wife. Sometimes, sometimes there are those outside influencers that can create division instead of oneness. And for the sake of this sermon this weekend, I call those outside influencers in-laws. <laughs> Somebody applauded. Now, I have not experienced this. Let me confess to you, I love my in-laws. I, I do, I, I love my sister-in-law, I love my brother-in-law, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. Now, I can't necessarily say the same for my wife, but I think that we both love our in-laws. But the fact is, for many marriages, in-laws can prevent oneness. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. God has designed marriage in such a way that it requires a man and woman to leave, leave their father and mother. Up until that moment, mom and dad were the support system. They had all the answers. They had all the nurturing. They had all the advice. They had all the wisdom until that moment that that child left them and became one. Some parents have a hard time letting go. Uh, some parents want to continue to lead their child that has married off. Some parents want to continue to parent their child and give them direction and give them guidance and give them, the key word is, unsolicited advice. Now, if in-laws are preventing oneness in your marriage, you may have heard phrases like this in your home. <clears throat> Dad says he can come over and fix the car since you can't. Or, you don't cook like mom did. That's a bad one, right? And in-laws, what about statements you might make to your son or your daughter-in-law? Honey, if you want my son to eat your food, you need to cook it my way. Anybody ever heard those phrases before? Said those phrases before? Raise your hand if your parent offered advice that your spouse disagreed with. Raise your hand if your parents have offered advice Raise your hand if that unsolicited advice created tension in your marriage. Yeah, it often does. We need to understand that parents need to release their children to marriage. You see, dads and moms, you're not just releasing your son or daughter to a husband or wife. You are releasing them to marriage that God has designed for oneness. It's not just about the individual that they're marrying, but it's about this, this holy thing called marriage. See, now this does mean holidays. It means churches. It means privacy. Now, I admit that I hope for a future to come when one day, perhaps, at the holiday season, everybody's going to come to Joe and Christy's house for the holiday. I would love that. In 20 years of marriage, we've had only one Thanksgiving hosted at our house. We are always traveling and visiting. Now you say, well, that's not that big a deal. Well, think about how times have changed. We have kids that are involved in, in school and in sports, homework, plays, recitals, dance, extracurricular, extracurricular activities outside of the school. And those Thanksgiving and Christmas breaks that we get in the school system, we end up more tired because of all the traveling that we do as a family. Now, maybe it is a little personal for me, but all the kids, we load up all the kids, we get them in the van, we pack up everything that we would need for four or five or six days and we sleep on the couch, we sleep on air mattresses, we sleep at the floor, all because grandparents 
have decorated their house for Christmas or they've decorated their house for Thanksgiving. And there's this crazy pressure that is placed on young married couples that, hey, we want you to come home for Christmas. We want you to come home for Thanksgiving. Instead of grandparents thinking that, you know what, it's easy for granny and grand grandpa, it's easy for us to travel and to go visit the families so much more so than it is for them. They, there's, this, there's this crazy amount of pressure to please those people that we let go of while we're trying to form a, a family and we're trying to form a marriage and we're trying to establish traditions ourselves we're not freed up to be able to do that. Now, again, I love my in-laws to death. Christy, can we stay home this year for Christmas? We'll talk about it later. Okay. See, this means, this means this. Parents, you've let your child go. You have released them. They have got to be able to establish their own traditions. They've got to be able to establish their own family time, their own holiday season. In fact, they even need to go to their own church. They need to be able to go to the church where they can grow, where they can get fed, where they can get involved in. And of course, we all know that that's Calvary. A husband and wife grow through conflict together and when parents still hang on to parenting their adult kids, it does get divisive. Let your young married couple choose what's best for them without the guilt trip. Uh, let them choose. Don't guilt them. Encourage them. It's hard enough for a young married couple to work through conflict as it is because of our own selfishness. It's hard enough and it's only hurting them if there's this outside pressure that's focused on making them become the young married couple that you want them to be. You had your chance, right? Now you can certainly give advice. You can certainly speak into it when asked, but remember there's got to be a boundary established that they are their own couple. And finally, it's important for all of us to remember this. Oneness is never about you. See, in your marriage, if you want to attain oneness, you've got to stop thinking about yourself. If you want to experience oneness as a grandparent, you've got to stop thinking about yourself. Ephesians 2.10, the apostle Paul wrote these words and he said, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. As you experience conflict in your marriage, understand that much of the conflict experienced between a husband and wife is not caused by in-laws. It's because we forget to do what we were created to do. See, you and I in our marriage, we were created to do good works and it doesn't dissipate just because two became one. See, as an individual, you were still God's masterpiece. As an indiv individual, you were still created to do God's work, the good works, the good things that he planned for us to do long ago. Then doesn't it make sense that in our marriages as husbands and wives, we begin to focus on doing the, the things that he created us to do long ago together? See, that's God's plan for us in marriage. Oneness is not about you. He's planned for us to do things together, those good things that he planned for us to do long ago. That means going on a mission trip together. That means getting involved in a life group together. That means going to worship together. That means getting involved in our serve ministry together. That means making a difference together. That means loving our community together. That it's not just about one spouse or the other. It's about both working together to do the things that God created us to do. Now, as our, as our worship time kind of comes to an end, as our message time comes to an end, I want you, if you're experiencing conflict, if you're experiencing a difficult season in your marriage, I want you to grab your spouse's hand, whisper into their ear, 
God's got this. God's got this. He's going to carry us through this. We've been created for each other. Let's invite him to work through our struggles as we press toward oneness. At the close, I want to encourage you, when you leave our worship service, go back and sign up for a life group. It will change your life. Let's pray together. God, we want to say thank you for creating us. Thank you for designing us. Thank you for the way that you've designed the male and the female. Thank you for the way that it, it works together to advance your kingdom. Thank you for the children that are represented in this room. And thank you for the way that your love flows to us. And God, we ask that you would help each and every marriage experience the oneness that you have designed for them since the foundation of the world. Let them experience oneness as they serve, oneness as they love one another, oneness through the conflict. Help them to overcome because you are our great king who has overcome the world. Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to work. Allow the Holy Spirit to change and transform us all into the men and women you've designed us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.